My name is Victor Alfieri. I'm a local urban homesteader. Um, I live less than a half a mile from here. Um, an urban homesteading is an urban homestead household that produces a significant part of their food on the residence, consumed by the residents. Um, the urban homesteading movement, I'm a part of it. It's really inherently in all of us. Um, and why I do it and, and why uh, this is happening is uh, really it comes down to health and sustainability. Um, all with a common desire to live a more healthy, environmentally conscious lifestyle. Um, so why? Why is this happening? Why are people around the world starting to practice the type, this type of lifestyle? Um, bottom line for me, it's really realizing the truth and it's the reality. We have no idea what's in our food or where our food comes from. Um, also, it's about self-sufficiency. It's about becoming less dependent on outside resources, lowering our carbon footprint. Um, also, it's about creating food security. Right? We have insurance for many things. We have insurance for our homes, our cars, our boats. We even have insurance for the time of our deaths. But we have no insurance that guarantees us healthy food for our families on our, on our dinner plates. Um, and, and what's happening is our food system, is, it's the, it's the in, inevitable turn which is happening. Um, the big problem. It's big agriculture, right? Um, back in the 1950s, uh, when big agriculture started really booming, uh, a lot happened. Um, and what happened was, is they started to remove the roadside stands. They started to lobby the local governments, local politicians, and then you started to see all those roadside stands disappear. Because what it started to become about was about money. It's a money machine. And it's capitalism. Um, and there's really not much we can do about it. It's not so much more about the food anymore. It's about money. It's about, it's about producing as much money as you possibly can to help the food. And what happens is, is we're suffering from that. Um, our, our, the, the quality of our food is getting, getting depleting uh, year by year, and um, we're starting to pay the price. And the, the bottom line is really what it comes down to is monoculture. Monoculture is when you grow um, the agriculture of producing or growing a single crop or plant or species of livestock in one area for an extended period of time. And what happens is, just as an example, if you grow corn, corn needs a certain types of minerals and nutrients, and they continue to pull that from the soil over and over and over again. And what happens is you need pesticides and herbicides. You need this stuff because it doesn't happen naturally anymore. And you have to compensate for that. And now, now that's what you're seeing. You're seeing a, a ton of all these chemicals being pumped into our foods. Um, GMOs. Now, of course, I could spend g genetically modified foods. I could spend an awful lot of time talking about this. But the bottom line is it really comes down to Monsanto. Um, they are the single, as far as my, my opinion, they are the most single diabolical company on the planet. It is, is really frightening to me to think how evil man can be. Uh, Monsanto is basically taking the market, they're cornering it, they're patenting seeds, and they're patenting all this stuff, and they're basically um, taking control of the entire food system. Um, so, so really what it comes down to is education, and it really comes down to knowing where your food comes from. Um, just as an example, the USDA, on an average supermarket produce, travels 1,500 miles from farm to plate. Think about all the resources, energy it takes to, to, get, to get food on your table. Um, and, and the realities are uh, supermarket vegetables are harvested green from halfway across the world, never fully developed in countries like Latin America and China. I was just reading about how Whole Foods is now getting their food from China. How do we know what they're using in their foods? We have no idea. Once it's on a truck, it could say whatever it wants. It could say organic or natural. We have no idea. And what happens is, is they, they harvest this stuff before it's ripe, right? Because if it was ripe when they harvest it, by the time it was get here, it would be all rotten. So they harvest it for, before it's ripe. It never gets to fully develop. And those last crucial time of developing is really when it develops all those nutrients and minerals. 
And what they do is they ship them into these huge warehouses, distribution warehouses, and they pump it with ethylene gas. This ethylene gas brings out all the pigmentation. And you go into a supermarket and you see a wonderful, beautiful tomato. The problem is, is it has, it's lacking all that nutrition. And we know it now. We buy a cucumber or a pepper or a tomato, and they taste exactly the same. That's because they were harvested way before they were ready to, to be harvested, and they're pumped with ethylene gas. Um, and the USDA says eight days after produce is harvested, they lose 50, over 50% 50 of their nutrients. And that's really what we're seeing now in our supermarkets. Um, so nutrition, really how much is left? Um, hunger pains, does anyone know where hunger pains come from? No? Well, well what happens is, is the, the, the proteins, in the, the blood travels through your body, it travels through your frontal lobe of your forehead, and when it doesn't sense enough proteins, it sends hunger pains down to your stomach. And we've all seen this because um, we've all had like a pasta dinner or a Chinese food, and you, you ate a big dinner, and all of a sudden, an hour later, you're hungry again. That's because there was not enough protein in your food. And that's why you're hungry. And, you know, our bodies don't know, our, our bodies don't know that it's 2013. We still think we're on, you know, the plains in Africa and, and hunting and things like that. And when we got hunger pains back then, we ate fruit and berries and things like that. Now we crave cakes and candies and stuff like that. Um, you know, this is just my opinion, but I really believe that has to do with the obesity problem we have now. Because you get these cravings. And you get these cravings, and what do you do? You go after sweets, and you go after things like that. 20% um, of kindergartners are obese or overweight right now. Shockingly, that figure rises to 40% of elementary schools. And this is because you get, you, you, you get hungry during the day, and of course parents, they reach in their uh, cupboards and things like that. They give them candies and cakes to hold them over to, for, to dinner. But this is all because of the lack of nutrition and proteins in the foods. Um, uh, just to touch on eggs, USDA considers eggs fresh in supermarkets up to 45 days old. You can go buy a, uh, uh, a dozen eggs and they could be 45 days old and they say fresh as if they were, they were harvested two days ago. Also, there's a seven day packing window, so you really never know how old your eggs are. Also, when you bring home a, a dozen eggs, you're not going to cook all of them at once. So, you know, you're reaching into your refrigerator a week or so later, you could be eating 60-day-old eggs. Who on earth wants to do that? Um, and all these eggs are coming from commercial factory farms. And they're pumped with antibiotics. In fact, they hit eggs or with, with um, antibiotics before they even hatch. They, they stick it right through the shell, and they hit them with antibiotics. Um, you know, antibiotics are in our food and our water. Seventy percent of the antibiotics used in this country go to livestock, not people. Forty-eight percent of the natural, uh, national streams are tainted with antibiotics. We are in a constant drip of antibiotics. You are what you eat, right? So, you know, that's why I feel that we have a difficulty fighting off the common cold, and a lot of these antibiotics really don't even work anymore. That's why they're coming out with new ones. That's why we have a lot of the sickness that we have. Um, so, so picture this. We're a factory farm, and we're, we're, there, we're thousands and thousands of chickens, right? What do you need? Picture this room packed with people. Let's say we had 100 people in here, and the do door was closed, and we were here for a long period of time. Where are the chicken? There's a number of things we would need. We would need antibiotics, right? Because if one of us got sick, all of us would get sick. We would also need additives and supplements. We wouldn't have the sun to get those natural nutrients. So we would have to take additives and supplements. Also, we wouldn't be moving around very much, so we would need growth hormones, right? Because we wouldn't have exercise. And that's exactly what's going on with the chickens and the livestock that we're using. They're pumped with... Um, growth hormones, and that's why, you know, women, you know, young, I see my nieces, they're, they're developing much earlier now because of all the growth hormones that are in all the foods that they're eating. It's having a direct reflection on, on all of our lives. Um, this is just an example from 1950 to 2008. After 68 days, that's what a chicken looked like. 
Now, with all the, the additives, the growth hormones, after 45, 47 days, this is what we're getting. Um, you know, a, a remarkable thing happens when, when you take a chicken and uh, that's, that's raised uh, in, in that type of environment, that's not able to act like a chicken, peck around like a chicken, act in the natural environment. As soon as you remove them from that confined, stressful environment and put them in, in, in what's natural for them, a remarkable thing happens. The eggs immediately start getting healthier for you, right? The chicken doesn't have any stress anymore and they become healthy. Take a look at this. One third less cholesterol, they're already more healthy for us. One quarter less saturated fat. Two times more vitamin A. Um, two times more omega fatty acids, which are great for you. Uh, three times more vitamin E. Uh, seven times more beta carotene, which is the yolk. That's really fantastic for, for bone development and things like that, health, um, and to fight off um, things. So, so the, the beta carotene is really important, and we're missing that in our eggs. You notice when you go and you, you, you crack open an egg from a supermarket, the yolk lays flat. It's, it's really, really yellow. We're, we're miss, missing that really robust flavor from, from the eggs that we have. Um, just to, to continue to talk about, about knowing where your food comes from, this was a survey done with 2,000 adults. Think about this. 16 to 20 years, 23 years old, 36% of the people surveyed did not know bacon came from pigs. Young adults, 43% considered themselves knowledgeable of where their food comes from. Only 43%. 59% did not know butter comes from a dairy cow. Only 67% were able to link eggs with chickens. Three in 10 adults were born after 1990 have never even visited a farm. I mean, think about it. Have some of you ever visited a farm? Um, and, you know, we're starting to pay the price. Uh, uh, the average farmer right now is 56 years old in this country. Uh, farming has skipped a generation, and we're starting to pay for it. Um, recently, um, United Way of Passaic County did a study. Um, it's hunger-free communities, and um, it's a, a program on where's the food, determining the extent and the severity of food insecurity in Passaic County, which includes Wayne. Um, so there's a lot of food coping strategies that people use. They bought cheaper food, right? If you have $10 and you have a, a family and you have a couple of young kids and all you have is $10, you're not going to go to the supermarket and, and, buy, uh, and buy salad and a nice tomato. You're going to go to McDonald's and go to the dollar menu and buy yourself seven or eight burgers and feed your family. Um, you know, they're using credit cards and savings to do so. They're, they're skipping and delaying paying bills to eat. Um, they get help from relatives and friends. They go to government, government agencies and religious organizations. They eat smaller meals. You know, we're becoming very dependent on these, these um, our local governments, and there's just not enough money anymore. State and local governments um, are, are really struggling to survive, and, and we, we need to become less dependent on them. Okay, 52% surveyed. Um, they use one to three of these coping mechanisms. 15% use four to six coping mechanisms. 13% re reported skipping meals because there was not enough food. And I really think this is a really good indicator, this last one. 35% indicated that it was harder to get enough food this year than last, and that's what we're facing. As the economy gets worse, it's harder for people to make ends meet because everything is going up. Gas prices are rising. Energy costs are rising, and, and it's, it's just harder to get enough food for the following year. And I do not believe this is going to get any better. Um, unemployment and the underemployed. 74% showed some degree of food insecurity. And, you know, I like to bring this up because it's, and I like to talk about the truth about the unemployment rate. A lot of people say, oh, see it on the news, and it says uh, it's 9.8% of whatever it might, might, might be. That is absolutely not true. Okay, that, that, that number that the government puts out is a deception. 
we have to remember that people that don't qualify for unemployment anymore are not a part of that percentage. So think about all the people that have, have, have used up all their benefits or whatever it might be, a year or 18 months. They don't have any benefits more, but they're no longer the statistic. So I, you know, when we look at local towns like Patterson and things like that, we're looking at an unemployment rate of, I believe, as high as 30%. So, so when you see that unemployment rate, keep that in mind, that it doesn't count the, a lot of people that are off the, the benefits. Also, there are a lot of people who, who are distraught. They never even apply for unemployment. Also, think about when times were good where people were working off the books, and now they're no longer getting that available to them anymore. So that unemployment rate is, is a farce. It's simply not true. Um, single parents. Of, of, of children under 18, 65% of single parents are showing food insecurities. They just don't know where they're getting their next meal. So, so we have this problem, right? It's a huge bummer. Um, we have big agriculture that's, that's really just concerned about money. They're not concerned about our health anymore. We, we have, um, we have uh, supermarkets who, they, we don't control what they buy. They control what they buy. We have to buy what they have. And um, we have uh, climate change and all these things. And, um, and so we have these problems. But, you know, we have the solutions. They're right in front of us, and they're quite simple. Um, you know, we, food availability, access to food, rising food prices, lack of knowledge on how to grow, store, pre prepare healthy meals. One of the big things is, like when people go out and see, uh, you know, a farm to table, they might go to a farmer's market and see a different type of vegetable. They're not used to it. They see it and it's fresh, but they don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to cook it because they've never seen it before. And that's the lack of knowledge that's out there. Um, and we, we need to start working on it. So it all ends up and it all equals down to food insecurity. So it is really time to start taking back control. Um, and uh, like I said before, supermarkets, they're the ones who are in control. They buy the food. We have to buy it. So we have these problems, and we have the solution. And it's quite simple. And, here, and we have a lot of problems, and sometimes it's very difficult to solve them. They cost too much money. They're too difficult. People just don't have the know-how. We have the simple solution. The simple solution is the garden. The garden, for me, is the cure-all. Um, I just want to give you a little information about my property. My garden, I live, I live a less than a half a mile from here. I have 16 big and small gardens, only totaling 500 square feet. I only use 5% of my property, and my pr productivity is 1,600 to 2,000 pounds a year. I only have a quarter acre. It's not very large. The, the average farmer averages a little over one pound per square foot. I average about three and a half pounds per square foot. 80% um, of my har uh, produce is grown on my property. Of course, I buy bananas and stuff during the winter and, and apples. And, and what's happening is, is studies are showing that larger properties are very inefficient. You need a ton of manpower. You need tools. You need big equipment. Um, what you're starting to see now is a lot of kids are going to some of these colleges and they're going back to their family farms. It's difficult for them to find work. And they're going back and they're, they're, they're teaching their parents how, you know, we could be more efficient. And they're starting to shrink down these farms and they're starting to be more productive. They're starting to make more money. They could charge a little more for the organics. And they're finding that they don't need all these, this manpower and all this, this equipment that needs to be fixed three or four times a year. So the smaller, the smaller properties are becoming more efficient. Um, and how that is done and how I do it is I use a, an old method, which is now becoming popular once again. It's called square foot gardening. It was invented by Mel Bartholomew. He was an engineer from New Jersey, New Jersey native. Um, this method um, was uh, uh, invented back in 1975. And after 35 years, it has become the most efficient, practical, cost-effective, highest yielding backyard uh, gardening on the planet. And what you're seeing now, it's being implemented all over the world. And the, the goal here is to use less space, less seed, less time, less water, less resources, and what you're getting is a bigger harvest. And it's actually quite simple. If you buy a pack of, 
uh, carrots, uh, a carrot seeds, you look on the back and it says, what you're supposed to do is plant one carrot every six inches, right? We all are familiar with the old row gardens, right? They take up too much time, uh, too much space, too much time and resources. With this, if you follow that old method, you would plant 16 carrots in seven and a half feet. Now you have to water that seven and a half feet and you have to maintain it and weed it. Now this new method is why don't we just take that same 16 carrots and put it in one square foot. We can all manage one square foot. You get exactly the same yield. You removed six and a half feet. Here's another example. This is a four by four garden. Okay, look at all you can grow in four by four square feet. Carrots, radishes, onions, beets. Of course, a broccoli is a lot larger, so it's going to take up a full foot. But look at all the different variety in just a small little area. Um, probably the size of some, some tables that you have in, uh, in your dorms. Not very big, but look at all the pr production you can get. Here's another example. This is the size of a, 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 a tables that were downstairs, it was something like this. Uh, four by eight, look at the different varieties in this small, small uh, watermelon, broccoli, garlic, cauliflower. Um, and, and you could do a tremendous amount of variety and it's compact, it's easy to manage, anybody can do it. And when you look at gardens, you know, I look that everything's a garden. You know, you could repurpose anything. This is a square foot, right? This is a square foot. This is a square foot. Any pot, anything that you have is a garden. It just needs to be filled with some soil and you're on your way. And that's square foot gardening. Here's an example of repurposing something. Look at how innovative this is. This is a regular old coffee can with some holes pop, uh, popped in the bottom. This is my backyard. This is my wife. This is a terracotta pot pulling, pulling 90 day old carrots out of a, out of a pot. Um, very simple. Um, this is, I always love this. This is one of those canvas shoe holders that you hang on the back of your door. Look at how innovative is that is. You can grow your lettuce, arugula, um, your oak leaf lettuce, and, and you can harvest that all summer long. And it's vertical. It doesn't take up a lot of room. Um, of course, it has to have proper drainage. And you could really use anything to start gardening. Rooftop gardening. Look at the size of these watermelons. This is becoming very popular in our local cities. A Baltimore is doing, um, I'm sorry, Brooklyn, um, um, Jersey City, Newark. They're all using their rooftops to start growing tons of vegetables. These are some gardens I've built. I call this the, the bad back garden. You could put a wheelchair right under there. It's, it's, it's uh, handicap accessible. This is a garden I built at the Cerebral Palsy Center. You could do it right on rocks. It just needs to be filled with soil. That's, another, that's a garden in my backyard. And the, the wonderful thing about these gardens and the raised beds is they extend your growing season because the sun heats these boxes earlier in the year and later in the year. So you get an extended period of growing because the box heats up and the soil heats up. So seeing is believing. This is my first garden. We grow over about 600 pounds of vegetables in here every year. You could see how packed it is. If, if you have room for weeds, you could surely grow something, right? So we pack it up as much as we can, and, and you see how, how packed it is in peppers and different varieties. Um, this is a before and after of, of our garden, and you see th this is already planted. That turns into this. Um, and you see I have a high side here. You do all your climbers. You have your sugar snap peas, your cucumbers, and, um, and look, how, look how packed up this is with, with um, uh, peppers. Another example, you see the whole back side that's built up. You, every garden has a front, a middle, and a back. And um, you could see how much you can harvest, 800 pounds from one garden. This is my, my wife. This is one cherry tomato plant over six feet tall. And you can see a watermelon right down in here. Sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes pack a ton of uh, nutrients and minerals for you. And it's really one of the easiest things to grow. I would say carrots and sweet potatoes are the easiest. And it packs the most for the East Coast for our hardness on, on and they're easy. You plant them, 
They grow. What's nice about it is you don't get a lot of weeds because all, all the, um, the foliage blocks the sun and you get wonderful, fantastic, soft tasting, beautiful tasting um, sweet potatoes. These are um, strawberries. Each white flower will end up being a strawberry, um, but we harvest about four or five pounds a year out of this. Um, vertical gardens. If you see, these boxes are only three feet by three feet long. You, you, of course, you plant on the bottom, but then you use the vertical garden, and they could really be put anywhere. Backyard, side yard, front yard, driveways, balconies, patios, or decks. It can really go anywhere. Um, some more examples of, of vertical gardening. This is my front yard. Um, these are 160 plants. These are, these are organic Martha Stewart seed. And I was really surprised. They did very well. I harvested corn all summer from this. Um, and that's just an example. If you don't need a lot of space, and you can you could really uh, produce a tremendous amount of produce. Also, it's another example. This is only one foot wide by eight feet long on my driveway. These are sunflowers for sunflower seeds. I have climbing cucumbers in there. This is some of the corn. And this is a broccoli plant that's about eight inches across. Just some other examples of some harvest, some fresh strawberries. This is a bunch of purple tomatoes, some, some basil from herbs, and of course peppers, all different kinds, cubanellas. So my wife, these are 90-day-old carrots. That's just like what you're going to buy in the supermarket. The only difference is it's not packed with chemicals, herbicides, and pesticides. I use none of that in my property. It's completely unnecessary. If you rotate your crops um, and you work on your soil, you'll, you'll get wonderful vegetables. Um, this is also um, a, a big harvest of 35 pounds of peppers. Um, these are big beefsteak tomatoes and honeydew melons, which I grow in my front yard. And this is just an example of you do not need a lot of space. This is a garden that I have right in my front yard. This is my oak leaf lettuce. When I want a salad, I go out in my front yard, right out my front door, and I harvest my lettuce. And this is another example of a square foot garden, oak leaf lettuce, some more oak leaf lettuce. Um, cantaloupe, also grown in my front yard. That just is, looks beautiful, right? You've seen that in all supermarkets. I grew that a half a mile from here. Also, um, of course, eggplant, different types of tomatoes, and here's another eggplant. Another square foot garden, just a, just a plastic container. Um, this is an example of the, the raised beds that I use, and this is a watermelon and a honeydew melon. Um, one of our harvests, um, of course, we have, to, we have to preserve a lot of this, but this is towards the end of the year. Cubanella peppers, onions, carrots, um, of course, tomatoes, uh, cucumbers, many different types of tomatoes. And, you know, it's really about quality of life, and, and it comes down to the harvest. Uh, nothing makes me happier when my wife goes with a little wicker basket and goes out and harvests dinner for us for the night. So what it comes down to is a lot of people think that it's all about the sun. It really isn't about the sun. Of course, sun is important, but, but really what it comes down to is the soil. The soil is the most important thing, right? Think about aquaponics, how successful that is. What ha there's no sun involved in that. You could do that in your basement. What happens is the water runs through the roots. It carries all, carries all the nutrients and minerals to the roots, and then the plant grows. There's no sun involved in aquaponics. What's important is what's delivered to the roots. And that is what I spend the most time on, is always the soil. The soil is, is what's going to make your, your plants grow and give you the proper nutrients. Um, soil, good soil, includes two things, carbon and nitrogen. Your carbon is, of course, is your browns, your leaves, um, your, your, um, your, your leaves, of course, your branches, um, anything that's dead, um, barks, dust, um, even brown paper bags, coffee filters, things like that, eggshells, peat moss. The nitrogen are your greens, your grass clippings, your manures, um, anything organic that's coming from your kitchen, your, your kitchen uh, waste matter. And um, 
My, my soil mix is quite simple. I make all my own. It's everything organic from my kitchen, eggshells, yard leaves, grass clippings, a chicken and quail droppings, coffee grinds, shellfish. Now shellfish is great with shrimp casings and stuff like that and also um, ashes from my wood burning stove which pack a ton of nutrients. This is a compost bin. Um, this is quite simple. Uh, this is something I designed. What I do is I put all the big stuff in the front. I pour it through a screen. All the small stuff falls to the bottom. I flip the screen back over and it puts all the big stuff on the other side. It's a really nice system and it enables me to get about six, uh, 16 cubic feet of, of great soil. Um, so, so with that, you know, I, I remember I worked on Wall Street for many years and I remember, you know, I, I could care less about the environment. You know, I thought these people were crazy. And, and I'll tell you, after my first garden, everything changed for me. And now I'm the biggest tree hugger you'll ever see. And, um, and it's because of this garden. And, and that's why the gardens are so important. So, so, you know, once you start practicing this type of lifestyle, you, you start doing your part and every little bit helps. Um, but most of all, urban homesteading is about learning. It's bringing back the old skills that have worked for hundreds of years. This has only skipped a generation. It's really inherently in all of us. Um, and we all have stories of our grandparents who have the fig trees and all the tomato plants. So, you know, we have to start bringing that back. Um, so anybody can do this. And, you know, we're facing a big problem going forward. Our populations continue to grow. We're at about 312 million in this country. We're at 7 billion worldwide. We're expected to hit uh, 10 billion by the year 2055. We have got to start learning now. And we can solve this problem if we all start to have, do our little part and, and start having just our little gardens. Um, and now I understand a lot of you guys are in school, but there are opportunities for you out there. I, I understand um, William Patterson has a community garden. But there's also another one not far from here, right on Burdan Ave. In fact, it's not built yet. I'm going to start building it on Friday. So if you all want to come down and see how it works, you can surely just come and watch, or you can help out and help build the gardens. Um, it's going to be built on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, it, it's not far from here. So you can either participate in that, or of course, get involved with your local community garden. Um, so I want to thank all of you for coming. I really appreciate it. I have a website. Um, my phone number and email address is on that. Um, any questions, anytime, give me a call, shoot me an email. I'd be happy to help any one of you. Um, but I urge you all to start thinking about this. It's, it's something we need to start, start focusing on going forward. The importance of healthy, organic food. Um, is really important. Let, let, let's think about this. There are three things that are very important to us. We can't survive without them, right? You can't survive three minutes without air. You can't survive three days without water. And you can't survive three weeks without food. And it's really what the least amount of what we know about. And, it, and we really start to need to start focusing on those three things. We can't survive without them. Um, this is just a quick example of what we can grow in our area. So, rambled on in there a bit, but uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes. What do you do as this content? I'm sorry? Like when all the, like if you have like insects coming into like the vegetables and eating them, what do you do? Like, sure. Well, I believe the insects are good. Um, the, the, you know, we want worms, we want insects. That's good. If they want your plants, they must be good, right? So I always think that that's, that's a positive thing. But, and, and there are, insects are not going to um, really affect the vegetables. They're not going to maybe dig into a tomato. Maybe a chipmunk will, but not the insects. I think it's just a fact of life. Um, there's something, once you start gardening, you're going to have to deal with that type of thing. And there will be insects. Um, when I get stuff like alphids and things or, or um, um, caterpillars that start eating my, my broccoli, of my broccoli flowers, I walk around with a pair of tongs, I flip the leaves over, and I pull them off and I throw them into a bucket. I do try to do, I do everything organically. There's, there's a solution for everything. It might take a little bit longer, 
but it's a lot better than spraying your plants with, with chemicals. And that's really what this is about. Um, let big agriculture do that. Let them use all, the, all those chemicals. We have a simple solution, um, and, and, and we, we, we could take advantage of that. Yes? About how much time on a daily basis do you spend with farming companies? One hour. Uh, about seven hours a week. Once, of, of course, there's a little bit more time in the beginning, but once you're planted and all set, the, the square foot gardening method, it, it's quite simple. Uh, you just go around, you do your little weeding. Uh, maybe you spend one hour per day on each garden that you might have. It goes fairly quickly. And um, yeah, I'd say about an hour a day. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's harvesting and there's cleanup at the end of the year. But during the whole season, there's not much you have to do. And, and as far as watering, you're going to water a lot more in the beginning of the season. Once everything's established, you don't have to water so much. In fact, there's a point where you might water too much. And people make that mistake. You've got to let stuff do its own thing. And I always say to, to people, is it's all visual. If you see your plant, it's going to tell you just by the way it's sloping or the plants are dripping. Sometimes the flowers turn a little bit. That's telling you it needs some water. So it's all visual for me. If I see it, then I'll water it. But if not, I kind of just leave it alone once it's established. Yes? Um, as far as container gardening, do you have to worry about, um, I would imagine you do, if you're going to start an organic garden, about um, any, because you said you could do it in pretty much anything. And I've yeah. been seeing uh, lots of really cool different things. Like you could take old dresser drawers. And, but what about the finish on the wood? Do you have to worry about the chemicals? on treated wood, leaching into the soil, or even like uh, the cans, like tin cans, if it's, if it's worried about if it's aluminum leaching into the soil. Sure, there, there's, you could really repurpose anything, but there are going to be some hurdles, and you will, you will find that some things you won't be able to use. Um, but, you know, I've done a ton of research on the treated wood, and I'm really, I haven't found a lot that says it's not good. Um, they use a zinc, I believe, and, you know, you have to compromise sometimes. You're not going to always get exactly what you want. Um, there are compromises you have to make. But, um, um, yeah, there are some things that you, you probably wouldn't, wouldn't want to use. The most, the most inexpensive wood and the best use, wood to use is white pine. It's what it's, you could found, find it anywhere. It's a fencing material. It's very inexpensive and it lasts quite a long time, uh, probably 10 to 12 years. So um, that's your best bet. But yeah, repurposing is fantastic. Anything that can hold soil, it, it can be used to, to have a garden. Yes? Um, I recently learned that Monsanto has bought out a lot of organic seed companies. Yes. Do you have any recommendations for where to get your seed? Yes, Monsanto, like I said, um, they've really, they're buying and they're patenting the seeds. So they're owning the rights to the seeds, and they're doing this all over the world. In fact, this country, believe it or not, is the one country that's starting to accept this sort of thing. They've been thrown out of other countries like, like Brazil, and I know that India just banned them. And in other countries, they're burning down their cornfields. For some reason, we've come complacent with it, and we've learned to accept it. And um, yes, it's, it's, it's bad. What, what I do recommend, it's going to take a little time, search it. There are a lot of seed companies out there. They're a little bit more expensive. They're the heirloom seeds, a little bit more expensive. And, and, but a package of seeds, you'll get about anywhere from 100 to 200 seeds in there. So it's worth it. But um, it's, it is a little difficult. I know that you'll go to Home Depot, and you'll, Home Depot and you'll see the big thing. And a lot of it is not organic. So you have to be careful. Um, but most of all, once you get it, now you grow your organic stuff, you could always harvest the seeds. So you can use them over and over again from year to year. So you, you, you know, keep that in mind that you're really only going to buy maybe a pack of seed one time. But look online, they're out there. Um, but you really want to look for the heirlooms. Um, very few. There's always, it's always a very small little section uh, in, in all of them. Um, but just keep looking and, uh, you know, um, pull up with someone and, and get a friend and, and order them together. Um, because once you involve shipping and stuff, it could become quite expensive. But I, see, I save seeds all the time. No matter what it is, I save the seed because you never know when you're going to need it. I have a little tackle box. 
I have little packets. I put it in the bottom of my refrigerator. I keep them in a cool, dry spot, and they last an awful long time. Anything else? So, so getting, getting back to it, um, you know, we're facing these issues, and, and we have simple solutions. And um, I'm just encouraging as students to start considering this going forward and, and think about stuff like the ethylene gas that's being pumped into the foods, um, the, how it's harvested eight days before, before and, or eight days after the produce is harvested. It's losing most of its nutrients. And, and what brings a hunger pain? You know, this is very important to remember. The, the lack of proteins in our food is really what causes us to be hungry. And the obesity problem. And you, can, you could counter that by what you eat and how you eat. Okay? Thanks. <laughs>